Hi and welcome back to my review of the ICO board and the iStorm open source FPGA synthesis toolchain. And as you can see we're picking up where we left off with the blinking lights demo. Now to understand how the synthesis process actually works, let's take a look at the contents of the make file. And as you can see from the source code here, it involves three steps. And the first of these steps involves Yosis. Now Yosis is a powerful framework of conversions and optimizations and transformations to digital designs. And in this case, it's being used to load up our Verilog code that we've written, and then it will simplify it and optimize it as best it can, and then it maps it into into the primitives that are available in the ICE 40. Now inside the ICE 40 the fundamental unit is the logic cell and each logic cell contains a four input binary lookup table with a single output and a one bit flip flop and so Yosis will be transforming our Verilog into a design that's fundamentally built out of these units and then once the transformation is complete it will emit the output of our design into a BLIF file now, BLIF is a general purpose format for declaring the digital designs in file formats, but in this case, the BLIF file that's emitted will only contain primitives that really exist within the Lattice ICE 40. Now, the second step in the synthesis process is performed by Arachne PNR, and this tool's job is to provide three key functions, packing, placing, and routing. So the packing process involves taking the logic cells which are declared in the BLIF file and packing them together into logic tiles because in the ICE 40 each logic tile contains eight logic cells and so we want to try and find a way of most optimally arranging the logic cells into the minimum number of logic tiles and by doing this we reduce the amount of scattering uh, of our circuitry by co-locating related functionality within a small number of tiles. Now once the packing process is complete the tool then proceeds to do place and root and this process involves iteratively trying to figure out what the optimal arrangement of the logic tiles is to minimize the uh, complexity of the layout and then performing the uh, routing to try and figure out what the minimum uh, amount of wiring is necessary to connect everything together. And once this process is complete, it outputs an ASC file, which is an ASCII description of the configuration of the FPGA. Now the final step of the synthesis process is performed by IcePack and this tool takes the ASCII FPGA configuration description and converts it into the binary bitstream that will be loaded into the FPGA and that is the complete synthesis process. So now we're going to have a look at attaching some peripherals to the board and one option the board provides to help us do that is these four PMOD connectors that you see around the outside. Now PMOD is something of a standard among FPGA boards. It was first produced by Digilent, who are a major producer of Xilinx based boards. And uh, they added these connectors around the outside that allowed for plug-in modules to be attached into the board. And they sell a wide selection of different uh, modules that you can plug in uh, on their website. But over time, other FPGA vendors began to use the same standards on their boards. And also other people, uh, third-party vendors began to produce uh, P mods. So at this point, there are about 120 different P mods available on the market. And there's a fair few vendors that produce FPGA boards that have PMOD connectors. Now it isn't uh, completely a standard among FPGA boards. The proprietary vendors still have quite a few different standards out there that are competing. But PMOD is by far the most common. So it's good to see it here on this board uh, rather than defining something new. Now when it comes to the structure of a PMOD connector uh, they're just 0.1 inch headers uh, with 12 pins. Two of the pins are ground, two of the pins are power and then the remaining eight pins are all IOs. And they also define a common standard for the spacing between two connectors. So some PMODs are double width, which means that you can gang multiple PMOD connectors together to get more IOs for larger and more complex devices. And they're typically used for uh, peripherals where the bandwidth and the data rate is not too high uh, because unfortunately there is a limit to 
uh, what kind of data rates it's possible to transfer through a connector like this that isn't properly impedance controlled. But for what they are, they are a very, very good choice to have on this board. Now, as it happens, I am in fact the proud owner of a small collection of PMOD modules. All of these are made by Digilent. And so you can see on the left here, I've got this four button module. The four buttons are all debounced, which makes them a little bit easier to deal with. And this is an example of a single row PMOD. It only needs six pins, uh, not the full 12 of the connector. Uh, there is this uh, rotary encoder that I have and also a slide switch. Uh, there is this seven segment display, dual seven segment display. Uh, and this is an example of a dual gang PMOD. It takes the two PMODs side by side. Uh, this is a D2A converter and it has a reasonable bandwidth, uh, hence why it's got an SMA for the, for the output. Uh, this one's quite cool. This is a, a little Ethernet adapter for the board. It's got a little network controller chip on the, the back of it and it communicates with the FPGA using SPI. So that does limit the bandwidth throughput of this thing. But even so, it can be quite handy for getting your board onto the network. And I also have this full color RGB OLED display, which is 96 by 64 pixels in size. So with all these peripherals, it allows you to do some really cool things with the FPGA boards. And now I have a little demo for you involving the four buttons and the OLED display. So in this demo, you can see I've got the buttons and the display plugged up to the ICO board. And you can see I'm driving a video image onto the display at 60 frames a second. Now the OLED RGB module is controlled over SPI and it has a little controller in it that controls the actual pixels of the display itself. So the FPGA is acting as an SPI master and generating the video signal that's being put onto the display here. Now in this firmware, there are four different operating modes, four different video sources that you can select between with the button presses. So this is the default video source, number one, which generates the video output from the contents of the FPGA's internal SRAM. And here you can see I pre-populated the SRAM with some nice open tech lab channel graphics, looking very, very attractive, of course. Then if we select video source number two, you can see that I've got the screen filled with random noise, which is being generated in real time by a random number generator running in the FPGA. And this is being generated by a linear feedback shift register, which is a super simple random number generator that uh, is easy to implement in FPGA fabric. And then if we select operating mode number three, we've got this rather attractive graphics hack that generates a nice pattern of colors and gradients that scrolls along over time. And then if we select the fourth input, it's a very, very simple uh, binary counter made out of blocks. Now, if you're interested in finding out more information about how the FPGA firmware actually works, I recommend you check out the show notes, which are linked down below, and you'll find links to all the bits of source code which I'm demonstrating today, as well as lots of other supporting information about the ICO board. But to give you a quick overview of how the firmware works, I have this diagram. Now, the firmware is nothing particularly complex in the grand scheme of FPGA designs. And at the heart of the design, we have this module here, uh, which controls the display and sends images into it. And as I mentioned, this communicates by sending the imagery over SPI. Now, the hardest aspect of this is that we have to go through quite a complex setup procedure to get the display to light up in the first place and we have to send about 20 different SPI commands through to the display to get it configured before it will light up in the first place and then thereafter it just sends video frames at 60 frames a second and it draws these video frames from the various inputs. Now, there are four inputs, as I mentioned. We have the RAM source that uh, displays uh, images from RAM, like the Open Tech Lab graphics. We have a random noise source. Uh, we have our colorful gradient uh, display and the binary counter display. Now, both of these inputs rely on uh, the XY coordinates so that they know what uh, pixel to uh, set to what color and therefore they rely on this little module here and this receives the pixel index that's being 
currently displayed and calculates the XY coordinates of that pixel uh, which these two inputs use to generate the display. And then we have an input selector that's driven by the buttons. And one final aspect of the firmware that I haven't mentioned yet is that we also have a line of communication between the Raspberry Pi and the FPGA and so with this the FPGA implements an SPI slave and so the Raspberry Pi acts as an SPI master and can transfer updated imagery into the internal SRAM of the FPGA and so the Raspberry Pi can replace the stock uh, open tech lab graphics with uh, other photos or images and it can even update it in real time and send video streams through to the RAM which are displayed out on the display over here. Now in addition to the SPI link there are a few other connection channels on the Raspberry Pi expansion header but not all of them are wired through to the FPGA. So for example there's a UART port here which would be great to be able to use but unfortunately these wires are not connected through to the ICE40. Now of the ones that are available there are nine general purpose input output pins. Now these are pretty slow to control and pretty slow to read but they certainly have their uses for sending simple signals back and forth between the FPGA and the Raspberry Pi. And of course I've already mentioned the SPI port which is by far the best and fastest data link available. And I've been told that 32 megahertz transfers are possible and it might be possible to go quite a bit faster than that which is why it's the right choice for this demo design for certain. Now there is one other channel available on the expansion header as an alternate configuration which is the SMI, the secondary memory interface. And with the SMI it will be possible to do fast parallel communication with the FPGA accessible as a memory mapped coprocessor device in the Raspberry Pi's memory space. Now this will be really fast and with DMAs it would require really no CPU load to do really fast transfers. But unfortunately the ICO board isn't wired up quite right to properly allow this. Now some of the wiring is present so it might be possible to make it work. Uh, but for example if it does work it will be necessary to unscramble the data with bit shifts in the CPU just because of the way the wiring has been done. Now I asked Edmund Hummenberger about this and he said it might be possible to correct the wiring in future versions of the board and I'm certainly tempted to try it out sometime even as it is because it might be pretty quick but uh, I'm not going to try it in this video it will get too long but I might try it out in some video in the future. Now while we're on the subject of transfer rates I'll just mention that if you're using the ICO US baseboard instead of a Raspberry Pi then you can communicate between the PC and the device through the FT2232H in the middle here and the second port of this device is wired up to the header pins and according to the spec sheet this allows transfers of up to 80 megabits per second which is pretty good. Now in order to send data from the Raspberry Pi through to the ICO board I've written this little utility in C and it's a tool that takes the input from a Unix pipe and will send it through the SPI port of the Raspberry Pi. So if I run this command I'm going to take the input for example from devu random which is an everlasting random number file and as you can see it's filled up the screen with random noise. So now let's do something a little bit more well, useful. I'll uh, use FFmpeg to generate a video input. I'll set the log level to zero, otherwise it's a bit chatty. Uh, RE makes it go real time rather than racing ahead when we take a file input. I'm going to be playing Big Buck Bunny, that famous open source movie, and I need to resize it to 96 by 64 pixels to match the display. The output format will be in raw video, uh, raw video pixels being sent out, and I need the pixel format uh, to be RGB565 because this is a 16 bits per pixel display and that's the uh, uh, pixel format that we need. I want to send the output into a pipe, uh, this pipe, and I'm going to send the output of that pipe into PMOD Odoloid RGB Stream, the streaming tool. So if we run that, here you can see the opening one or two seconds of Big Buck Bunny coming up, and of course, some of us have seen this movie many many times uh, for testing various things. Now if I uh, kill this I can do something else uh, for extra swag points uh, because I actually have a webcam plugged into this um, uh, 
uh, into this Raspberry Pi. So we're going to take the input from Video for Linux 2 and I need to specify the device node of my webcam. And if I run this, here you can see me talking to you with my beautiful face through this strange contraption and uh, feeling rather smug about it. Now the implementation of this design takes up 9% of the logic tiles within the FPGA and 75% of the RAM tiles which are needed to store the full frame image. So you can see we really don't have very much RAM internal to the FPGA which is why it's a good job that the ICO board has some off-board RAM for us to use. So if we load up the design inside the layout viewer, we can get an idea of how this design's been implemented by the routing tools. And so as we look at this layout, along the top edge here, these are the connections to the two P mods, particularly uh, along in these pads here, we've got the various connections going off to P mod number one, which is the OLED display. And you can see these wires are connected through to this section in the middle here. This big blob here is the OLED display controller. And as you can see, it's by far the largest part of our design. And this blob here uh, implements the setup sequence for the display. And you can see that's taking up a big chunk of our FPGA fabric to implement that. Then uh, in these two rectangular areas here we have the RAM for the RAM input source and we have the various address decoders laid out adjacent and these decode the addresses that are being written to and read from into selectors to uh, connect into these various RAM tiles here to select the right one based on what address is active. Then over here, nestled in this corner, we've got uh, some of the implementation of the uh, video hack number one that implements the scrolling colors and gradients. Up in the corner here, we've got the implementation of video hack number two that is, is the binary counter with the uh, blocks counting up. Uh, the coordinate decoder, some parts of it are down here and some other parts of it are nestled over here. Uh, then over here in this little corner we've got the random number source uh, PRBS source is uh, located somewhere in this mess here uh, then the SPI slave receiver from uh, the Raspberry Pi some of it's located here and some of it's located down here and that just about covers everything that's in this design but if we just zoom in on the initialization controller that sends out those SPI commands to the OLED module you can just see how complicated this circuitry has become and I'm very thankful that I don't have to implement this manually by wiring things up by hand. So one thing to take away from all this is that FPGAs are very good at implementing simple tasks that need to happen at very high speed or with very tight timing constraints. But the moment you try and implement anything with any significant degree of complexity or with lots of internal states, then you find yourself very quickly using up lots of the internal logic resources of an FPGA. And those kinds of problems are much more appropriately implemented as a software solution rather than a hardware solution. Now, if we take a closer look at the code of the PMOD controller and specifically the code for the startup sequence, you can see that it consists of this giant case statement, which selects its way through the various states in the state machine for the startup sequence. And as you can see, each one of these states involves setting an SPI word to a certain value that will be sent, specifying the number of bits to send and the number of clocks to delay once that command has been sent out. Now, given the regularity of this, uh, state machine it's much more it'd be much better to implement this as a piece of software than a piece of hardware and so one way we could potentially reduce the number of logic tiles in use would be to convert this state machine into a form of microcode that we could store in a RAM tile and then we could implement a very simple interpreter that would execute the microcode step by step until the display is completely configured. Now one thing that becomes immediately obvious when implementing any kind of non-trivial design is just how difficult it can be to debug issues in a running FPGA because for all intents and purposes it's a black box and we get no visibility on what might be going wrong internally. And for this reason simulation is an absolutely vital part of the firmware development process. Now within the open source world we have some excellent simulation tools including Verilator and Icarus Verilog which is what I'm running here. So the simulation would run through a test bench 
uh, you would you simulate your whole design or a subset of it, say an individual module, and attach it to a harness, a test bench, which generates various kinds of input signals uh, designed to test for various states, and then collects all the outputs. And then this whole test bench assembly is run through the software simulator, and then the outputs are displayed in a waveform viewer such as GTK Wave, which I have here, which is also an open source tool. So here I have a simulation of the OLED controller, the SPI master for the OLED display. And if we zoom in on this, you can see we've got a section where we're sending a series of commands out during the initialization sequence. And if we zoom in here, you can see the various pulses of SPI being sent out in the simulation. But we can also zoom in and see the various internal states as the machinery of the OLED controller goes through its various processes. And we can add anything else, any other signals we want to see, uh, get that deep insight into how the whole thing might be running. Now this wouldn't be an open tech lab video unless I gave SIGROC a brief mention and so I've exported the relevant signals from GTK Wave and I've loaded that output up into SIGROC Pulse View. And as you can see we have the SPI signals and we're zoomed in on that same group of messages in the startup procedure. And I've also added an SPI decoder and configured it so that we can see the messages that we're sending through. And if we zoom in here you can see SIGROC is decoding the bytes in the messages that we're sending. And then we can go back to our hardware design and to the uh, data sheet and make sure we're sending all the messages that we should be sending. And we can do all this without ever needing to touch any real hardware. Now before we move on I just want to talk briefly about the four flat flex connectors you see here and you see this sort of thing commonly on lots of different FPGA boards because most FPGAs have large numbers of IO pins and therefore these wires are usually connected up to some connectors so that the user of the board can attach peripherals to build up whatever prototype they happen to be working on. The problem is that unlike with PMOD, there is no standard for wide high bandwidth connectors in the FPGA space and every single vendor uses their own connector and of course uh, PMOD is not wide it's only got eight con conductors and it's not fast because 0.1 inch headers are really going to limit you in terms of the signal integrity issues you're going to encounter and these are going to really ruin your signal when you uh, start trying to do transfers of 50 or 100 megahertz. So it would be really nice if there was a common standard established for this. And it's a real shame that there isn't because this is something that FPGAs really excel at. Wide, fast buses are something that FPGAs are so good for. And it would be great if there was an ecosystem of peripherals just like there is for the PMODs. Now there's a couple of standards out there that I'd like to see adopted. Really any standard would be great to see adopted, I don't really mind, but uh, the two that I think are most promising are perhaps uh, SizeIGuy, I don't know if that's correctly pronounced, but there's a website about it. It uses SanTech connectors. Uh, the only problem with this is that there's only a, one supplier of those connectors. The other alternative that I like more is Toffe that uses PCI Express card connectors. I think that would be really cool to see on FPGA boards. Uh, being able to plug things in uh, using the connector of PCI Express. Now against these contenders, how do the flat flex connectors we have on our boards stack up? And for a while I did think that they were a worthy contender up with Toffe and Sizergai, but unfortunately there are one or two problems with the implementation that I think make it slightly less than perfect. But let's talk about what's good about this. I really like the flat flex connector. I think it's a great choice for this application. It's compact. And also there is a second source for this. So there are several different vendors who make connectors that are compatible with these. And all we have to do is plug in our ribbon cable just like this. And then the connector has this little flip over bar and it plugs in just like that. Another thing I really like about this is that they have laid out the power pins to the connector symmetrically, which means that it, even though it is quite confusing which way is which, because on one end of the cable, 
there is pin 1 going to 51, but on the other end of the cable, pin 1 becomes 51 and pin 51 becomes 1, uh, which can be quite confusing. And so it's quite easy if you're working on a prototype peripheral board to end up with your pins in reverse order, uh, which of course could cause all kinds of problems. But because with an FPGA, every single I.O. pin is flexible and uh, swappable, all that it matters is to make sure that the power pins don't cause a problem. And the way they've connected up the power pins is to make sure every single one of these is symmetrical. So the 3 volts is symmetrical with the 3 volts and the ground is symmetrical with the ground. So it isn't possible to end up with any kind of uh, power short circuit or whatever by getting the power pins reversed. So I really like that. The only thing that I would uh, quibble about with this thing is that uh, this is not an impedance controlled type of arrangement so uh, that's going to be limiting at really high speeds and also they haven't wired up uh, the signals on these connectors using differential pairs which is also another thing that would be really nice to have because when you're getting up to high speeds LVDS low voltage differential signaling is quite a common way to get up to those higher transfer rates so I think these uh, connectors are not too bad at all but uh, could be better but could be a lot worse as well so nice job guys Okay, so now it's time for the final demo of this video, and as you can see here is my setup. I have this dual 7 segment display plugged into the ICO board, and the firmware is running, and you can see the digits are counting up in hexadecimal. And over on this side, you can see I've got a USB serial port, and that is wired up through some little wires into one of the spare PMOD connectors. So at first glance, this demo looks all very straightforward, but appearances can be deceiving, and there's some really interesting stuff going on inside this thing. Now what makes this demo interesting is that it has been implemented inside a soft core CPU which has been created in the FPGA fabric and that CPU is running this extremely simple piece of software and you can see the C code of it here it's really simple we've got a for loop that's counting up this one byte value I and that value is being set to display on the seven segment display every loop it's also being printed out with this printf and we have a second printf here that's preparing a buffer with a string in it and that string is being sent through the serial port and then we have a little delay loop here to stop the loop spinning around too quickly and that is the complete functionality of the demo. So in this demo we have our whole system on chip implemented as logic within the FPGA and the code of our demo, the C code, is running inside this RISC-V core. Now RISC-V is a relatively new CPU architecture, it's an open source architecture designed to be implemented by multiple vendors and therefore there are several implementations out there and so this has been implemented with Pico RV32 which is a very minimal implementation of RISC-V written by Clifford Wolf who wrote almost everything I'm showing off in this video today. Now this CPU core is connected out to various peripherals through an AXI bus and this exposes the various peripherals into the memory space of the CPU. And so we have our internal block RAM within the FPGA is exposed to the CPU and this is where the CPU can store its internal variables and the state of the program. The external SRAM that the ICO board has is also mapped into the address space of the CPU core and then the various device peripherals are mapped into other address spaces within the 32-bit address bus. So for example, the seventh segment display controller, it works by exposing a certain memory address to the RISC-V core, and when the RISC-V writes values into that address, these are displayed onto the seven segment displays. And then similarly, the RS-232 serial transmitter, it uh, transmits data out of a small FIFO, and so the RISC-V core can send bytes by writing those into that FIFO data area. And similarly, there is also a FIFO interface to the Raspberry Pi, and this is how the communication of the printf text is sent to the Raspberry Pi and also it's used to load the firmware up into the RISC-V core to get the whole system started and this is implemented by sending communication through the GPIOs it bit bangs the data on a simple parallel bus and then the ICOSOC program is able to send and receive data to control the RISC-V core so the way the system is structured is not at all dissimilar to most other microcontrollers
Now the system on chip is assembled using Clifford Wolf's IcoSoc project, which is a simple tool made of make files and Python scripts designed specifically for the Ico board. Now there are more sophisticated open source system on chips uh, toolkits out there, but IcoSoc makes it nice and easy to try things out with this specific board. So the structure of this demo is defined in this config file, icosoc.cfg, and as you can see there's one or two options defined at the top, and then we list out all the peripherals which are attached to the memory bus. So here you can see the RS232 a peripheral, and it receives the first block of addresses, we configure the board rate, and also the connections which pins it's linked onto of the FPGA. And similarly with the seven segment display module, it receives the second block of addresses, and it's connected to P mod ports 1 and 2. Now IcoSoc when it's run goes away and takes the Verilog of all the modules we've defined here, for example this is the code of the 7th segment display module, it takes this code and the code of all the other peripherals and the code of the CPU and builds a memory mapped backplane to link it all together and then it also takes the code for uh, our demo as well as driver code associated with all the modules which is defined in this Python script and it takes all the Verilog code and all the C language code and compiles it and then from all that it builds a complete system image. Now if we take a look at the layout that the router has produced you can see that it is pretty complicated. 78% of the logic blocks have been used in order to implement this design which will give you a good idea of the capacity of these particular FPGAs. So I'm sitting within the IcoSoc repository and I've already built the firmware which takes a few minutes to do. So we're ready to load it onto the FPGA for a second time but this time we can watch the output on the various consoles. And to do the loading I've got this make file command make run and with this environment variable set it will do it remotely so that I can do the building and loading from my workstation and send it over to the Raspberry Pi that's located at this IP address. So let's go ahead and run this command loaded the firmware already and there we go the software has now been loaded and is printing and we have the printf coming out the top panel and the output of the serial port coming out of the bottom panel now if you're interested in trying this out for yourself I've left instructions in the show notes on how to get this going it's pretty simple to get set up to build the firmware the only part that's a bit time consuming is building the cross compiler GCC which we need to build from source so that it can target the RISC-V CPU now personally I find all this pretty cool that so much of this is possible just with open source software and of course that includes my code, the drivers, the software compiler toolchain, the hardware synthesis toolchain, the architecture of the CPU and even the hardware implementation of it. To me that is pretty impressive and it just goes to show what is possible now within the world of open source and it's all thanks in no small part to the pioneering work of Clifford Wolf. Now at the moment the ICE40s are the only FPGA that's fully supported with open source tools and in order to achieve this the internal structure of the FPGA and its bitstream have had to be completely reverse engineered and the reason for this is that the FPGA vendors typically keep this information a closely guarded secret. But the problem is that the ICE40 is a rather modest FPGA. It's not very large, it's not very fast, and it doesn't have much internal RAM or any super speed peripherals. And it doesn't have any DSP blocks to support multiplication, which are vital for signal processing applications. Now it is possible to synthesize multiplication operations out of logic blocks, but it takes a huge amount of fabric to do this. So the ICE40 will never be a very capable FPGA in this regard, whereas FPGAs with lots of DSP blocks can crunch through these kinds of calculations at extreme speed without eating up all the tile space. But fortunately there are moves towards extending the open source tool chain to support a wider variety of devices. Now as I mentioned, FPGA synthesis is a three-step process and Yosis performs the first step of mapping the FPGA design written in Verilog into the blocks that are available in the FPGA. So here we are in the GitHub repository of the Yosis code for doing the technological mapping, the techlibs directory. Now you can see here there are a few different devices and vendors listed here, but the only ones that have a complete open source toolchain are the ICE40s and the Green Pack devices which are designed by Siligo.
Now, the Siligo Green Pack devices are pretty cool. They are a mixed analog digital device, and they're designed for power control applications. They're rather tiny, and so they're not a direct uh, equivalent to an FPGA. They're a slightly different beast. But out of these two, the Ice 40 and the Green Pack 4, these are the ones that have complete open source tool chains. Now, if we look at how the tech mapping for the uh, ICE 40 works, you can see that most of the code in here is Verilog. So if we look at this Verilog file, for example, we can see the blocks that are available in the FPGA have been described. And so what Yosis is able to do is take this Verilog code of the units contained within the device and take the Verilog code of the user's design and map one into units made out of the other, which is a pretty awesome capability. Now if we jump out back to the TechLibs directory, then we can see that there are support for a few device, devices made by other vendors, such as Acronix and uh, EASIC. Now the devices made by GoIn are quite interesting to me. They're a Chinese device, Chinese vendor, but I couldn't find out much information about them or how to get these devices. So let me know if you know anything about them. And of course we've got the big players, which are Intel Altera and Xilinx. So for these devices, Yosis can do the technology mapping for these devices, but there's no support for place and route or for bitstream generation. So these steps still have to be completed by the vendor tools, which is certainly useful in some cases, but you're still tied to the vendor tools for half of your synthesis process. Now, if you're thinking of contributing to the development of these tools, it's certainly a lot easier to add support for these devices to Yosis because you only need to know the structure of the logic blocks present in these devices, which are typically listed in the reference manual, as opposed to the bitstream information, which is going to be undocumented. So at this point, because the information is available, I see no reason why Yosis couldn't be built up to support basically every FPGA that's on the market right now. Now, as I mentioned, Arachne PNR is the application used for packing, placing, and routing. But unfortunately, the tool is hard-coded for the ICE-40s and doesn't support any other devices. Now, I did some investigation a while back to figure out if it could become more general purpose, and my opinion is that I don't think it can. And so to support more FPGAs, we're going to need something else to do the placing and routing. Now, one candidate is VTR, Verilog to Routing. It's an open source tool. Now, a VTR allows the structure of an architecture of an FPGA to be described in an XML file. So in principle, it can do the routing for just about any FPGA. But in practice, VTR up until this point has only really been used as a tool for researchers, not so much for real FPGA synthesis. So there are one or two features which might need to be added in order to make it work for this task. But that's not beyond the realms of possibility, and from my previous interactions with the developers of VTR, they seem really keen to help make this happen. Now, when it comes to bitstream reverse engineering, there are a few different projects around working on various FPGAs, mostly by individuals working in isolation. But perhaps the most well-developed of these is Project X-Ray, which is another Clifford Wolf project. And this project is working on reverse engineering the Xilinx 7 series, and in particular the Arctic 7 FPGAs. Now, the work of reverse engineering the bitstream mostly involves writing various scripts that drive the vendor tools, and it sends in various fabricated input designs and various constraints designed to push the router and the bitstream generator into various states that will reveal the information that they're working to internally. So a project like this is certainly going to be painstaking work, but it is by no means impossible for someone who has time to work on it. I'd like to contribute myself, in fact, but right now I'm rather tied up with producing videos for you. But I certainly think it will be interesting work, especially if you like solving puzzles. So if you're interested in joining in, as of this week, there's a new website here, SymbiFlow, which is a place where all the FPGA reverse engineering projects can coalesce together. So here we are at the end of the video, and I think it's fair to say that this device is pretty awesome and well worth a look if you're looking to get into FPGA development, especially if you want to try out the open source tools. Now, if you want to purchase one, you can get one from Trends Electronic. They're selling for about $105, and they also offer a cut-down version that has a smaller SRAM, and that's available for the bargain price of just under $60. So do take a look if you're interested in finding out more. But that is about it for this video. I do hope you found it interesting. Give it a big thumbs up if you did, 
and leave your comments down below. I'm always reading my comments and hopefully I'll see you next time on the Open Tech Lab.